Okay, so um, thinking about uh, the native water traditions uh, on the Northern Plains, it's just a very fascinating topic because uh, of course the Northern Plains are a high desert. And so if you look at it, if you do the kind of the basic math on the riverways and um, the lifeways here on the Northern Plains and going down to Nebraska, um, you'll find that even though rivers um, represent literally like 1% of the landscape, um, you find that 90% of the, uh, the trees, um, wildlife, um, either are on that river or uh, subsist because of that river. So they are a uh, extremely vital resource here on the Northern Plains. And I think native people have always understood that and their traditions uh, associated with water um, have always held strong. Um, so we know that uh, when Lewis and Clark came uh, up the Missouri River in 1804, 1805, and then on their return trip, uh, that the waterways were all clean, uh, going into uh, the Yellowstone River Basin uh, on William Clark's return voyage. Uh, he also found that same discovery that the waters were clean to drink. Um, that uh, you know, there were, they had not been polluted. Um, that there was no sign of um, uh, trash or refuse or anything that had been posited in the rivers. And so, uh, you know, and of course that's just anecdotal cursory information. But we know uh, now, looking back on the record, that people, in fact, did have very strong uh, ethics towards. Uh, their water and uh, there was no refuse or waste placed in the water that includes human waste uh, whether it be um, you know relieving yourself urinating uh, whatever it is people did not there was a strong taboo against any kind of waste going into the water because that was where everyone drank from and they they had a an understanding of germ theory, even though they didn't know what germs were, they seemed to understand the nature of contamination and um, how contaminated water and other resources could lead to infection and ill health. And so that was a mantra that my tribe, the Upsalaga, has held um, that we learn as children growing up. You know, when I was growing up in Crow Agency on the reservation, swimming in the rivers and the ditches down there, you know, no one ever used the bathroom in water. Um, and uh, we would always get out. And then when I came to Bozeman and we floated on the uh, Madison River um, as a college student, I remember asking someone foolishly, you know, on the float, what are we going to, how are we going to use the bathroom? And everyone, I, I don't even think they thought I was serious. Um, you know, it was just like, of course, we're going to pee in the river. And to me, it was, um, you know, I mean, after I thought about it, I thought, well, of course, you know, but at the time when I was growing up, people didn't do that. And that is a really ancient uh, value, I think, and it's taught. And there's a saying in Crow, you know, if you pee in the river, your grandmother's soup is going to taste sour. And, uh, you know, it's, a lot of kids learn that um, when they're little, a little saying, then it kind of sticks with you, you know. And so then that just, there's a sensibility around water that it needs to be protected. And um, looking back on the history of how tribes used winter campsites uh, because they had to winter shelter by, uh, you know, waterways, uh, the extreme nature of the Northern Plains winters, uh, the extreme temperature drops and wind and uh, potential for high snowfall, um, just forced people down to the rivers. Uh, but the um, seasonal way of life that uh, had, has been going on here on the plains for thousands of years was that after the winter was over, people would move camp. They would um, 
you know, changed where they lived, changed places. And they would go from down by the river. Uh, they would have to move in the spring because of the, uh, the spring floods, because of the mosquitoes that come back, because of the grizzly bears that, that are awakened in the spring and come to the river to, to uh, harvest fish and other animals. And so it's no longer a high amenity zone. Um, it becomes a place that is uh, competitive um, and, and it's, it's a busy place. It's the highway. So once the spring and summer comes around, that's when native people would leave those campsites. I think historically, a lot of them would just leave their teepee poles there along the river um, and then return towards the end of the summer to again, establish their winter campsite uh, to make sure that they would survive the winter. And that process, that cyclical nature um, allowed uh, for a lighter uh, touch along the edges of the campsites. Um, you know, there was a, there was a time for renewal. Um, you know, the, what waste was, deposit, was deposited in the areas offshore um, would have time to uh, biodegrade um, and to um, naturally uh, be diminished. And a lot of that was based on the size of the camps, of course, um, where most winter campsites here uh, in Montana and probably in the Dakotas, um, we're thinking of between uh, 100 and 200 people. Um, and so there was a way of life that naturally allowed uh, the rivers to, to be uh, refreshed and to not feel uh, uh, too much pressure from people. So I'd want to start my talk by, by establishing that, that kind of ancient way of life that had been here for many thousands of years uh, on the Northern Plains and along the Missouri River. And the Missouri River, I think, is such a unique and special waterway um, that it almost has its own its own rules apply, um, just like any other waterway that would be unique and um, have different resources available, larger amounts of them, um, and, and resource scarcities in other areas as well. So um, I'm going to kind of explore that just a little bit as I go here. Thinking about the Missouri watershed, and I know uh, down in Lincoln, um, you know, the Missouri River comes through there. I'm here in Bozeman where the Missouri River starts. And um, so all of the rivers that I grew up swimming in, all of the rivers that, um, you know, I grew up having ceremony, um, all flow into the Missouri eventually. And so th this watershed that we're in here um, is really. Um, I think it's one of the most remarkable in the world. Um, thinking of the Rocky Mountains, um, the Great Plains, um, you know, the, the, the timbered area out on, along the plains, the, the, uh, the Pine Hills. It's such a beautiful and remarkable place um, and really um, one that you know, for thousands of years, people have treasured and to continue to today. Um, I put some photos in here. Uh, the top photo is a, is a picture of the Little Bighorn River, and that's the river that I grew up in. You can see some kids swimming there. And that's my uncle, John Doyle. Um, my uncle John has been instrumental in protecting the Little Bighorn River uh, for over 35 years now. And, um, you know, they continue to make progress, him and his team. Um, he works at the Little Bighorn College. And uh, they're always doing monitoring and testing of the water, the Little Bighorn. The Little Bighorn flows through a valley that is, has a heavily uh, farm. And so there's a lot of uh, potential and there is a lot of excess chemical uh, waste that goes into the river. Uh, also a lot of uh, cattle um, and uh, unprotected human waste that ends up going into the river uh, for different reasons. Um, and so the infrastructure along the river um, 
you know, needs needs to be updated, needs to be repaired, pipes, um, uh, the, the systems that uh, people use, the septic systems, um, all of those are topical issues for the Little Bighorn River. And it's always, you know, there are many issues that, that confront uh, fixing those problems. Um, you know, funding is one of them. Um, being able to, to, uh, to institute the type of projects that, that will cost some money. Um, but they are making progress. As I mentioned, they're, they're uh, you know, building awareness. They're helping people to understand better um, how to um, interact with the river uh, in the new in the 21st century. And so if you ever want to look him up, uh, him and his team, uh, they've got some published uh, reports that they've uh, done um, that should be available online on the state of the Little Bighorn River. Um, you know, growing up along the Little Bighorn River, it's a very ceremonially used river. Excuse me. So there are many sweat lodges that are set up along the river and uh, the sweat lodges um, are cleansing ceremonies where water is brought in and poured on hot rocks uh, to create a steam and the steam creates a, a cleansing uh, sweat um, and prayers are said and they're uh, sacred ceremonial herbs that are burned. Um, you know, such as uh, sweet grass, uh, bare root, cedar leaves, um, sage. And so, um, and water is also drunk in, at that ceremony. And I would say that the majority of Crow people who have sponges along the Little Bighorn River are actually drinking water right out of the river uh, at their sweat lodge ceremony. And so that's what my dad did. Um, he never thought twice about, you know, the pollutants, the, uh, you know, the E. coli um, that, that are present in that river. Um, he just believed in the power of God and that his prayers were going to be enough to protect him and that the water was sacred. And, um, you know, I don't think he ever got sick. I, I'm not sure I share that same faith in, in what I'm drinking. And I certainly would not advocate or condone people drinking water uh, with a faith-based approach. Uh, as a scientist myself, I believe in you know, testing and making sure that the chemicals are not there, that, um, you know, that we can feel free to drink the water in a way that we can show and prove that it's, that it's safe to do that. Um, and not just sweat lodge ceremonies, but many different ceremonies that occur there, um, Native American church, uh, Sundance. And so water in the historic and ceremonial use of water and the continued use of that water to today, very much contingent upon that water being clean and safe. And we know that it's not. And so that, that is a problem. That, I think that is something that we look forward to hopefully addressing in, in the years to come. Uh, so, and then the photo underneath that, you can see, of course, the protests at Standing Rock um, galvanized the native community throughout the Northern Plains and throughout the country. Um, of course, the, uh, the, the battle goes on uh, to protect waterways um, against corporate intrusion. Um, we see it all throughout the West. Um, it's it just, it's a back and forth. It feels like it's always a political issue. Um, but at the end of the day for native people, I think that it becomes something that they all can agree on. Um, it becomes something that they can all take a stand on. And Sandy Rock gave people an opportunity to come together to really um, celebrate those values and to champion them. And um, I think looking back on, on all that, uh, that turbulent, tumultuous time, um, there, are, there are good things that we can take from that uh, event.
Um, and then some historic images below that uh, along the Missouri River, uh, the Mandan dots on Rick Bra, North Dakota, and then uh, some horses, a man with a horse down on the Little Bighorn River, again on in my homeland, Crow Agency, uh, not far from the famous Battle of the Little Bighorn. And so, uh, you know, just, just to get a sense of where we've come from, uh, where we're at, where we're going uh, in terms of our relationship with our waterways, with, with, with our rivers. And I, that's the kind of the context, I guess, that I wanted to place my, uh, my comments into, in today. Um, as I mentioned, uh, whoops, kind of, I thought I saved that, it's not presentation title. Um, as I mentioned, and as was mentioned, as Jesse mentioned at the beginning when he introduced me, I am a curriculum designer. I do design curriculum for public schools, colleges, um, everyone in between. And so I wanted to share a lesson that I created a few years back. Uh, that really uh, was stunning to me because I had no knowledge of this before I actually did the research and wrote the lesson. This lesson is available on the National Park Service website entitled Honoring Tribal Legacies Along the Lewis and Clark Trail. This map um, was uh, recorded and written by a, by a French a uh, fur trader named Peter Fiddler. And he worked for the Hudson's Bay Company and he was one of the very first white men to come to the uh, Rocky Mountain region and establish a fort. And so he established his fort at the confluence of the Red Deer um, and Saskatchewan rivers in Canada. And uh, upon his arrival, he sent out word that he was hoping some native people would come and visit him and give him some description of the land. So, because he wanted to uh, initiate a trade partnership, a trade relationship that he believed was gonna be um, really, you know, something that was gonna be, uh, help make him rich. Um, and his partners uh, with beaver trade and other uh, items. So he arrived in the summer of 18, 1800, I believe, and uh, built, built his fort. And over the course of about six months, many different uh, native people came to visit him and share knowledge about the land. And then one day in February uh, of 1801, a man came by the name of Feathers. And uh, his name is a Blackfoot chief and uh, translated his name, or his name in Blackfoot was Akmomikmi, and uh, translated it meant feathers. And he, uh, of course, him and Peter didn't speak the same language, but he used some sign language. Peter Fiddler did understand some sign language and uh, feathers asked Peter to come outside and he drew a map on the ground for him in the snow. And, uh, this is what Peter wrote from the map that Feathers drew for him in 1801. And so has, I'm, I'm, you know, if I was in person, uh, I would be talking to you, uh, the audience, and I would proposition and ask anyone, does anyone know what that is? What we're looking at? Would anyone like to uh, say in the chat? Give us a interpretation of that map. Map of tributary rivers leading into waterway, the river, tributaries. Yep, topo lines of elevation. Yep. Routes that tribes followed along rivers. Yep, all those are pretty good, um, pretty good guesses. Uh, 
Well, if I asked you what these two lines were right here, what would you say? Ridge. Yes, that's right. That's the continental divide, mountain range divide. So when Peter Fiddler asked uh, Feathers to draw him a map, Feathers drew him a map of 500,000 square miles. Mind boggling geographic information from a Blackfoot chief in Canada who you would assume, you would have assumed probably did not travel further than a couple hundred miles out of the radius of his home for his entire life. I think probably most people would assume that. But yet he was able to describe to Peter uh, the Continental Divide. He drew two lines and told Peter point blank that there was no river that crossed the Continental Divide. Um, that's the reason for the two lines. He said there was a big river up here, the Columbia, and a big river down here, the Snake. And then, of course, the big river to the east, the Missouri. And then he named all of the different tributaries, the major tributaries of the Missouri that go from Canada, the middle of Canada, all the way down to the Bighorn River in central Wyoming. But that's just the start. Not only did he name all these rivers, but you can see the information written in here. This is. Um, demographic information that accompanied the drawing. And it's also written in the notes here. Feathers was trying to indicate how many days travel it was between each river, what the names of the nations were that were located along each river, how big each tribe was on each river, the name of the headman chief in each community and where the land had mountains, where it had hills and where it had grass. This was a map that was really beyond anything that uh, Peter Fiddler could have imagined. Um, it was, a, you know, not obviously not to scale or uh, perfect in any sense um, with regard to its uh, exact location of where the rivers are, but in terms of the chronological order uh, from north to south, the names and, and all of the accurate other, other accurate information about the people and the landscape, it is an epic map that, has, that there is no uh, comparison. It's, in, it's an incomparable map. Um, from the oral tradition. Um, you know, I've done some research. I've looked at, for other maps. I've looked at other maps made by Native people throughout the, the nation. Uh, there's a book about it. Um, I've looked at other maps throughout the world. I've never seen a, an oral tradition translated into a map that covered over 500,000 square miles. So you ask yourself, how does this man have this knowledge uh, about the rivers? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of answers to that, I think. But before we get to that, I want to show you what Peter Fiddler did with this map. Um, he took this map, he sent it back uh, to uh, England. He wanted to incorporate this map into uh, the knowledge that had already been established. At the time Peter Fiddler came to the Continental Divide, this is the map that was most popularly used um, for the known world in the Americas. You can see it's pretty highly detailed all throughout here until you get up into the Great Plains and there's a white spot on that map. And that's exactly where Lewis and Clark were headed. And so Peter Fiddler, of course, beat them. Um, and he wanted this map to be updated with the information from this map. So he sent this one back east, or 
yeah, back east and then across the ocean. And then in England, they incorporated uh, Peter's map into this and made this here. And I have a hard time understanding this map. It's to me, it's not that useful, but you know, I'm not a cartographer of the 19th century, so I probably can't really speak to that. But just looking at it from here in the 21st century, I don't see how this made it into here. So there's a lot of questions, but what happened was this map came from England and back over across the Atlantic Ocean in 1803 and made it into the hands of Thomas Jefferson. And he passed it along to uh, Meriwether Lewis. And so we're talking about a map that went all the way from the Continental Divide back to England, back to Washington, DC, and back again, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And one of the ironies I think that captured, captured me, captivated me right from the beginning was Feathers told um, Peter Fiddler, without any doubt, there is no Northwest Passage. There is no riverway, there is no waterway that connects the Pacific to the Eastern side of the uh, continent. That was just a basic fact. And then we are led to believe and we are, have always been taught, I think, as educators and students that Lewis and Clark were seeking a waterway, uh, a Northwest Passage. And um, I guess it begs the question, why didn't they listen to that man's map? Why, why was that, um, you know, kind of seemed to be ignored? When it, when it would seem pretty obvious that this man was quite knowledgeable. You know, I'm sure there's many answers to that and it's a complex answer, I'm sure, but I just wanted to throw that out there because again, I think it's pretty ironic. Um, and then of course we see that Lewis and Clark come, they come up the uh, Missouri River, um, they make it all the way, you know, well, they do have an incident with the Lakota Sioux um, as they make their way through the Dakotas. Um, and that was one of the closest that, that they came to actually um, having some type of a battle with the large group. Um, but you can see from this depiction here that um, once they sat down and smoked the pipe with them, that, uh, you know, they were able to uh, come to an agreement. And so uh, there was very much a ceremonial way of life on the Northern Plains uh, that had existed for a long time. And that ceremonial way of life that Lewis and Clark entered into was the, uh, was the cultural zone that allowed knowledge like the kind that Feathers had to be passed along from community to community. Um, and to also protect the waterways um, in ways that were sustainable and, and long lasting. And so, uh, but I think what we, what Lewis and Clark also entered into was a realm and a zone that had already been intruded upon by smallpox and horses and rifles and many other colonial offshoots um, before white people even came to the region, long before. Um, so another, you know, piece of uh, historical context to consider. Okay, I wanted to uh, now fast forward to uh, August of 2018. And uh, for an event that we had at the Missouri Headwaters State Park. Um, so, uh, I work with a group called Mountain Time Arts, and I want to show a short video. And this will kind of describe some of the work that we do. Let's see. First, I have to. Um, 
share sound. This project gives us an opportunity to think of new ways to come together. So really what this project is, is the beginning of a new way of thinking about water and how we're all connected to it and how each and every one of us needs it so much. It gives our young people an opportunity to think in an ancient way and also a brand oh, new you're not way video. about how they can okay. really celebrate the water and think about Let how they can here. cherish it. Thank you for letting me know. Um, okay. How about now? This project gives us an opportunity to think of new ways to come together. So really what this project is, is the beginning of a new way of thinking about water and how we're all connected to it and how each and every one of us needs it so much. It gives our young people an opportunity to think in an ancient way and also a brand new way about how they can really celebrate the water and think about how they can cherish it and, and with new ceremonies. The new ceremonies are something that tribes have always celebrated for thousands of years to give our young people an opportunity to create their own ceremonies that unite all of us, different skin color, different backgrounds. I think that's really one of the great treasures that this project is opening the door to. And rather than ending, it's actually just the beginning of a new way of approaching the sacred resource. So we just talked about thousands of years of indigenous history, and I think the Indo-European history here is a, it's a it's a snap of the fingers in in comparison. And we all we all think about this place. We think about Lewis and Clark, and and of course Lewis and Clark renamed everything. And uh, at this point, Gallatin was the Secretary of Treasury, and of course, Madison and Jefferson were politicians. The Jefferson, the Madison, the Beaverhead, the Big Hole, the Ruby, the Gallatin, the Cherry River, with the rivers it's water.
Hey Niskani. Hello my friends, my name is Jaya King and I'm from the Blackfeet tribe. We just offered a few prayers for the Soyita Bita, the underwater peoples, and thank the water for giving life to us all. In the native way, one way we name things is we name it by what it does. And so we prayed that we could honor this river by renaming it something more meaningful and true to its purpose, as it was a good source of choke cherry. Uh -huh. thank you. Okay, just give me a quick second here. Uh, what happened to my... Okay. So just a little video to kind of show you what, uh, what type of work that we've been doing here um, to bring attention to the rivers and that whole uh, Cherry River event, um, was based on the idea that, um, you know, the Gallatin River, the, the name Gallatin is so ubiquitous here in this valley, in this county. Um, you know, we have Gallatin County, um, and then Gallatin is on everything you can imagine, you know, um, Gallatin College, Gallatin High School, Gallatin, uh, you know, Gallatin Recreation, Gallatin Parks. We have everything everything you can imagine named Gallatin um, and the Gallatin River, of course, and coming out of the Gallatin Canyon. And yet there is no, there are no rivers named that have an indigenous uh, Aboriginal name. And so the idea was to, you know, if we subtracted one Gallatin out of 50 here in the in the valley and added, you know, replaced it with an indigenous name like the Cherry River, the Choke Cherry River, um, is what the the uh, Crow Indians called that river. And so the whole theme behind that performance art event was, you know, Choke Cherry River, and so that was the uh, 
you know, the um, magenta red that we use um, to kind of represent the color of the choke cherries and all of the different musicians that we had um, that played a role. And then we also had a soundtrack with historians and geologists and, um, uh, you know, biologists speaking about the environment, uh, the ecosystem there. And so it was an educational, informational, and entertaining uh, event that had a native theme to it. And we just kind of felt like that is a good way to, um, you know, move forward with these concepts, with these um, ideas in a way that uh, will enrich, enrich our public and help us to understand more the history of these rivers and so that we can maintain a continuity with their health over time. And, and so that was part of it. And I think I'm just about out of time. I, I had a, a few other things I wanted to share, but um, I kind of feel like uh, with these kind of these shorter presentations, it's nice just to hit a few, a few big concepts and uh, let people think about it for a while and maybe ask some questions. So I'm gonna open it up for some questions if you have any. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, you know, we did the past, we did the present and thinking about the future of the water. Um, I'm gonna share my screen briefly again. Because uh, there's a great slide here. Um, you know, I, um, oops. I haven't actually presented on this specific topic uh, before. And, uh, and of course, if you wanna visit and see the video again and learn more about the work we do, this summer we're actually, we have an epic project that I'm working on right now uh, in the Yellowstone Park. We're gonna have a teepee village. It'll be the first time ever. And that's gonna happen in August and we're still fundraising. Um, if you wanna go to the Mountain Time Arts website, you can find out more about that project. and. We will include um, we will include uh, musicians, native musicians. We've got native opera singer, a couple of them on tap. Um, we've got native uh, um, rapper that's going to be there, Superman. We've got the Bozeman Symphony that's going to be performing, um, and so it's uh, Mountain Time Arts. I think it's .org. Mountain Time Arts, maybe at mountaintimearts.com. Um, you know, my native nexus, uh, my my company, um, I do I do educational stuff, but I haven't spoken too much about the rivers here in Montana to public schools. Um, but Mountain Time Arts is the group that does the performance art projects and. Um, they, I work closely with them, um, and they've asked me to, excuse me, they've charged me with um, organizing and um, putting on the Tipi Village. So it's a really big project. And, um, you know, there are 27 tribes associated with the Yellowstone Park, and they all have an opportunity to, to have a Tipi in the village. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of communication, there's a lot of logistics involved. Um, but I hope, uh, again, that you can visit the website and check out, check out uh, some of the other stuff that we're doing. We've got a couple other projects that will be uh, connected to it. And also, if you want to visit that um, Lewis and Clark map that I showed you and look at that lesson plan, and there are other lesson plans uh, that I wrote for that unit. Um, that is at honoringtriballegacies.com. Um, and that uh, is just chock full of great curriculum all along the Missouri River. So 
when we were honoring tribal legacies along the Lewis and Clark Trail, that basically meant everywhere from St. Louis all the way to Oregon, along the rivers, along the Missouri, along the Columbia. And, um, you know, we don't have much curriculum from the folks in Nebraska yet. And we, you know, from the uh, Winnebago um, and the other tribes located there. And we haven't had much from actually the Dakota or Lakota. Um, so that's this project, that um, educational unit is something that is still alive and viable. And we're hoping to gain more knowledge from those uh, tribes, from educators in those tribes in the years to come. Um, thank you for putting that up there. That's great. Yep. So there's some great info there in the chat. And um, I just want to again, thank you so much uh, for, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. It's a great pleasure. And, um, you know, I just uh, hope you found some stuff useful and uh, interesting. You know, I, as I mentioned, the Missouri River is such a uh, such an important feature in the land, um, and it's so different from most of the big rivers here. In Montana, there are many rivers, and they all have unique and interesting names, except for the Missouri. You know, the Missouri is just the big river, <laughs> and so like it is different, you know, it's like the granddaddy. And I think people understand that, um, the native people understood that, you know, um, it's so big that crossing it and doing all those other things that you do around other rivers are just, you have to do them all differently. Um, living around it, you know, the only real Sedentary villages on the Northern Plains were on the Missouri River there uh, up at the Mandan and Hidatsa because they were able to, you know, establish that farming uh, culture there along that river. Uh, my tribe, we tried to bring farming to Montana and, you know, the archeological evidence showed that we had some success uh, on the Eastern edge of the state along the Yellowstone, but it was short lived. And eventually as we moved along further up the, Upper Yellowstone, we we quit farming altogether and became full-time hunter-gatherer traders. And so the story of Montana is kind of, you know, the rivers um, provide life, but um, it's a wild life. It, it is a wild life. It's a, it's a, a wild climate, unpredictable. Um, and, uh, but it's beautiful and we love it. And I'm sure you feel that way about your state as well. Thank you again so much. Um, I'd love to connect. Yep, yeah, whoever wants to connect with me, I'd love to connect with you. Um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat box here. And um, keep your eyes out for some, um, for some more, stuff I'm gonna be publishing about the native connection to the Yellowstone Park. I've written a few pieces lately that have been published over the past few weeks, but I'm continuing to write. And um, I kind of started with the basic archeological history of the Yellowstone Park. And now I'm gonna, I'm writing about the cultural uh, relevancy, um, all of the amazing and compelling stories associated with the way of life that was there for thousands of years and so keep your eyes out for that thank you so much everyone You're so kind thank you jesse Okay, the link to the video is on the Mountain Time Arts website. If you go to our projects, I think you'll be impressed. You know, uh, the Cherry River was one of our, I think, favorite, but we've had some great projects and we just, we're still doing
doing them. Again, like I said, this summer we'll have some more at Yellowstone Park. We just did one last summer along the Yellowstone River, an opera. And, uh, oh man, they're so powerful. There's nothing like performance art. And I would encourage all of you out there in the audience to keep in mind the idea of performance art events centered around the Missouri River um, that incorporate different musical and cultural facets to them because they're just so captivating and entertaining and they they bring people together like really nothing else can. And uh, so on a parting note, I would just like to say that that has been one of the great joys. You know, we don't get paid very much to do this work, um, but the joy that comes from it, seeing people really see the land for the first time in a way that is authentic, I think, for them on some level. Uh, there's just, just no amount of money. As Shane, I, we got the technology back up. And so if you've got just a couple minutes, I, I really do want to give a chance for people in the audience, if there's anybody in here who would like to ask Shane a question. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, hey, Shane, my name is Brooke. And uh, so I don't know if you, you might be able to speak to this or might not, but if you can, I was curious uh, if there's any effort to give the Missouri River legal rights as a person. And if you'd known about any effort that's being made. Wow. No, I, I'm not familiar. That's the first I've heard of that. Uh, you know, I think if corporations can get legal rights, then, then the river probably should get some as well. Um, I'm not familiar with that, uh, Brooke. Um, I would like to learn more about it. I think it's a fascinating concept. You know, we're having, we, we're struggling here in Montana with our wildlife, um, with different perspectives on wildlife everything from wolves of course the bison and grizzly bears and even our waterways you know Bozeman right now is so um I, it's hard to describe what's happening here in Bozeman with the home the prices of homes and the, the scale of the explosion here the population boom and one of the last places now that is getting inundated with housing is along the Gallatin River and there are a lot of um, subdivisions that want to be built right on little islands and right along the river in floodplain. And we don't have the zoning on the river in the county yet. And the commissioners are hesitant to do that because they don't want to miss out on, you know, the money that comes, the tax and, and all the other things associated with that. And so the more we start to get to a foundational understanding of what rights nature has, um that is a whole another conversation i think that hopefully our next generation will be having a lot more than we did shane this is chitran janre from the nebraska water center how are you um Good, thank you question i come from a, one of the eastern states of india with uh, 40 45 million total people maybe 8 million or so are tribal population uh, maybe two to three dozen tribes, uh, but they are pretty protective of their natural resources, especially Joanne Lumley from uh, UK made a movie about, uh, it's called Sacred Mountain. So they pretty much stop a mining uh, by the Vedanta Mines Corporation. But at the same time, that's a pretty hot spot for uh, biodiversity. But at the same token, they also realize that uh, their kids need to be educated to some extent. So what has happened in the recent years, there is a school, all free boarding school, 30,000 children are coming to the capital city and getting free education. And then some of them, and then the same person actually, he has an engineering college as well as a medical college, as private school. The proceeds and the profit goes to, uh, this uh, school, tribal school called uh, Kalinga Institute of uh, Social Science. And then now he has set up another one 
uh, in the tribal belt itself, I heard. So, um, so anything like that, I just want to hear happening in, in your part of the world. Well, wow, that's a very inspiring story. You know, I'd love to hear that. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, I know in the Southwest, um, the Navajo and the Hopi have been, um, I, I think probably in a similar boat, there's more people down there, it's drier. Um, you know, they, uh, they face a greater, I think climate crisis is probably than we do. And they have a huge mining, uh, coal mining income that they use to help support their tribe and their government. And so um, there's big opposition within the tribe about whether to close that coal mine down because of the water that it uses and other you know, aspects of environmental damage that it causes. Um, but I don't think that I've heard of any alternative, alternative. or, um, you know, supportive measures like the one that you describe that can provide young people with, you know, the type of uh, quality education um, in return for, you know, uh, some type of uh, resource support. Um, I'd like to learn more about that, but uh, I answer your question, I guess, is for a long answer. I don't know of anything myself, but I would like to see something like that. You know, my tribe, we, we have three rivers that go through our reservation and we have wanted to have a coal, meth, coal methane gas uh, conversion plant, but it would take so many thousands of gallons of water that um, it's, we, I think after it went through an environmental review, people said, no, I just can't do that. Okay, with that, now that Shane can actually hear our clap, let's give him a final applause. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Very kind. Thank you so it's much. Great honor. We hope you feel better soon. I'm starting to feel better.